What we're going to do now is a question and answer session. But before I you know, give it to the floor, I have two questions that I have to ask you myself. Um, and one of the questions is um, about aid. And you talked about how we need to stop viewing Africa as a, as a receiver of aid um, and, and sort of philanthropy, um, but something much more than that. But my question is, we've been doing that for so long that I feel like the continent is somehow even just beginning to be, or is very dependent on it. And how do we go about breaking that cycle? So that's my first question. Yeah, I mean, as I say, I've become chairman of something called the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund. And it's a challenge fund. You know, it's your money, your taxpayers. Uh, DFID is one of the donors. Uh, they are taxpayers from Canada, from Denmark, uh, from uh, Holland, from Sweden, all contributing to this fund. And it's a fund that's about linking, as I said, small and medium-sized farmers through agribusiness to global markets. It's about sustainable uh, energy and projects uh, that bring energy to uh, rural uh, Africa. But at the end of the day, it's a challenge fund. It's about public and private partnerships. And so it requires the businesses who are making applications to the fund to demonstrate that they're raising money through their own efforts and through their own equity, that they're raising money through their own relationships uh, with financial uh, uh, institutions. And it then becomes a partnership, a real partnership. And I think in Africa, we've got to get better uh, at raising money uh, from uh, our own tax base. <laughs> the reality is there's a lot of money in Africa. There are a lot of wealthy people in Africa. There are a lot of big multinational companies in Africa who are not actually paying their fair share of taxation in Africa. So we've got always to look at how we raise money locally. I'm an ambassador for an organization called Gavi, the Global Alliance uh, on Vaccine and, and, and Immunization. Uh, you know, this is a, 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 a private public institution uh, that works with the producers uh, of uh, vaccines to deal with some of the greatest killers uh, of uh, uh, children, greatest killer diseases uh, of, uh, of children. Diarrhea, and pneumonia, you know, these, are, these kill millions of kids. The result of Garvey's uh, work has been a dramatic reduction in child mortality in Africa and indeed globally. It's one of the few MDGs that was actually met in, 20, in 2015 in terms of the reduction in child mortality. But you know the way it works? It works through harnessing front-loaded uh, 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 investments, uh, uh, money raised uh, from uh, the private sector in private sector uh, markets, uh, in addition to uh, taxpayers', uh, taxpayers money, in order to invest uh, in the cold chain, to invest uh, in uh, inoculation uh, and immunization. But it requires the governments who sign up to uh, this scheme to find 25% of the money through their own efforts and through their own tax base. When we work in a community, we work with traditional healers as well as with clinicians. Uh, we work with the grain of the communities, the cultural grain of the communities uh, with which we, we are engaged. And the result of that uh, is effective delivery and lives being changed because everybody feels that they own it. And it breaks this cycle uh, of, uh, of dependency. But we'll only have that cycle of dependency if we ourselves foster it in ourselves and amongst fellow members uh, of the societies in which we live and in which we work, which applies both to Africa and, and, and in Europe. Because this is a two-way street. You know, it can be very comforting for people uh, to see Africa always as a supplicant. People in the main feel much more comfortable with supplicants than they do with equals. Funny that, but it's true. 
and, similar, uh, and similarly, it, it's sometimes much easier to put your hand out than actually to use that hand in order to pull yourself up. And so it requires a change in mindset both ways, both from the donor and from the recipient, so that you have uh, real partnerships. But when you do, that's really life, life transforming. And it can happen, and we're seeing it happen. So let's, let's change the way that we, we see development. And when we change the way we see development and the way we perceive each other, then we can really change the situation. Thank you for that. Okay, my second question to you is, um, whilst you did make history in becoming one of the first black person to hold a ministerial position within the government, we still don't see a lot of black people entering parliament and entering politics. And why do you think that is and how can we begin well, to Well, actually, you know, to be fair, we see many more black and Asian people uh, entering parliament and entering politics today than we have ever done in our history. Uh, the problem is today is how do you get young people full stop to get interested in politics? That's the that's real issue today. I mean, to be fair uh, to uh, this uh, conservative uh, government, uh, you have black and Asian members of uh, government at every level from parliamentary undersecretary to uh, cabinet minister. Uh, so real progress has been made. We've had record numbers of people, black and Asian people, uh, in parliament. That's fine, and I, I celebrate that fact. And I'm really glad uh, that whether uh, people are conservative or, or labor, they're putting themselves forward and they're getting elected. What I worry about is the total disenchantment on the part of so many young people, black, white, Asian, with politics and with Parliament. That's a much more serious threat, and that's a challenge uh, to, uh, to us in Parliament. It's a challenge also, of course, to young people to be prepared uh, to, uh, you know, put up uh, with what politics requires of one. And it's a rough, tough, and corrosive business, and I don't pretend uh, otherwise. But I think we've got to rediscover a politics which attracts people who have vision and which attracts people who have dreams and who want to make those dreams real. Politics, I'm afraid, has become over-managerial, uh, over-sanitized, uh, uh, and uh, has become something which, frankly, is a massive turn-off uh, for, many, uh, for many young people. That's an indictment of us all, young, young or old, and I think that's got to change. And one of the ways in which it does change is by young people saying, you know, we've had enough, we don't like the way things are, we want to change them, we want to become part of a movement for change. And I think there, there is an issue today in our world. Uh, I'm, I'm very lucky, you know, I'm 64 years of age, I am a child uh, of the 60s. Uh, I'm a child of a time in which we believed uh, that the world could be made a better place by activism and by becoming part of a movement for change. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, it's much more difficult now. The world is, is a more complicated place in many ways. Um, uh, and it's much more difficult, I think, for young people to have this sense that they can be part of a movement that can change and transform and transform things. But that's, that's, that passion has got, has, got to be, has got to be rediscovered. And we shouldn't be ashamed of being passionate, of caring, uh, of sometimes getting, getting angry, uh, and not being prepared to take it anymore, uh, and not being prepared to mask ourselves and our feelings uh, in managerial speak, uh, and in running away from strong views and strong opinions. I believe in strong views and strong opinions doesn't mean that you don't make compromises on the way, you have to. doesn't mean you don't reach out and form relationships with others, you've got to. Uh, but to have strong views and strong opinions and to be passionate about them, I think that's important. Okay. All right, we're going to open it up to the floor now, so if anyone has questions. Hello, um, my name's Simone DeGale, I'm an architect and I run an architect's practice. Um, I was really interested in your talk, thank you very much for your speech. And I wanted to just put to you that, you know, um, as a young entrepreneur, I mean, 
I'm assuming that most of the people here today are young entrepreneurs. It sounds really interesting, you know, to like have this perspective to like invest in Africa. And obviously, you know, as an entrepreneur, I've heard about um, Africa becoming more sort of investable and business opportunities, et cetera, and so forth in the last two years or so. And what I wanted just to put to you is that, you know, um, how do you, um, as, as a Lord, you know, who sits in the House of Parliament, how are you gonna make the opportunity more attractive to people in my seat, you know? Because as a business person, I'm interested in, you know, things that are gonna make me happy in my life. Um, um, you know, in I live in London, I live a, a really easy life, and it's quite comfortable, to be honest with you. But how, uh, why am I going to have, uh, in this, obviously in your day and age, it may not have been so easy, but in my day and age, it is much more easier. How are you going to make it much more attractive for me to want to you know, go the further mile or, you know, want to do more business and things like that. That is what I really want to know. You know, what... what to be frank with you, uh, you know, my job is not to make uh, Africa more attractive to you. My job <laughs> is to simply say, there's an opportunity there. It's down to you. You can turn your back on that opportunity. It's up to you. I can just simply tell you what I see and what I see is a continent that is crying out for investment. Uh, what I see here in Britain is an old country that is crying out for new opportunities. And if you simply stay still in life and you reflect on your past glories and you don't go out there and have a go and grab those opportunities, then ultimately you will decay. So the choice is, is yours. You can uh, stand still, you can stay and enjoy such comfort as you may, or you can say, I want really to make a difference. I want really to transform my own, my own life and potentially the life of other people by reaching out and doing some new stuff. Uh, and you know, it, it's, you make those choices. If you think, and if you want uh, a life in which you simply make do, then, you know, stay, hang around uh, and do what you can do. But if you want really to make a difference, then see yourself as a global citizen. See yourself as someone who has a contribution to make globally and not just locally. Now, that contribution may or may not be professional. It may well be that your professional opportunities come from the UK, come from Europe, come from, come from Asia. Who knows? I don't know. The mere fact that you're here and that we're discussing it under Dennis's auspices, that itself is changing things. So, th so the next step, next time you're at the RIBA, at one of their meetings, is to say, well, actually, what is, um, what is the RIBA doing with UKTI in terms of promoting British architecture in Africa? Simply to ask that question will be good for the RIBA. Because okay. I can assure you the RIBA does spend time in Dubai. <laughs> oh yes, they're there. They do spend time in the United States. They don't necessarily spend time in Africa. And I'm here to tell you that UKTI sends uh, trade missions to Angola, to Ghana, to South Africa, to Tanzania. So you ask where you are, what your organization, the RIBA, is doing about that. That's making a difference. That's what we can do together. But what we've got to get out of our minds completely is a notion that somebody else is going to do something for us. Sister, that ain't ever going to happen. Because what I've learned, what I've learned in life over these, you know, 64, 64 years is that the truth of that, of that saying by that great black American uh, 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 jurist who said, 
Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. And that's, uh, this is what Judge Douglas said, the son of a slave, and he's absolutely right. So the, the, no, don't expect anything to be done for us. We, we've got to do it. Viku zen zeli. If I am not for me, who will be for me? But, I'm, but if I am only for me, what am I? If not now, when? If not you, who? So the, the question I have to ask is more around, obviously you're talking about the agribusiness and mm. basically the development of economies within Africa. Mm -hmm. But what I understand to be fundamental to that is infrastructure. Yes. And in a world where you're talking about these new climate change um, objectives, you know, there's been a lot of um, heavy criticism on countries like China for pollution. And um, the general consensus from countries like China is usually that most of these other developed countries in the world have had their time to go through yeah. um, kind of, I don't know, mass pollution. Um, what, what is the, essentially the question I'm getting at is like, in, in the context of um, Africa trying to improve its infrastructure and ultimately become a place where people can get um, simple or how can I put it? Obviously that's not the only thing that, but, but generally speaking, you start off in, in the production line doing the more simple, um, relatively more simple outputs and then develop skills yes. and technology to um, make more complex products. So essentially, the question I'm asking is how, 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 how can um, Africa's growth work alongside the apparently new um, impetus on climate change? Well, let me just first of all go to your important point about infrastructure. Um, you know, I told you about my dad who went to King's College and who went to Gray's Inn. And he did so, sure, you know, he worked when he was here at uh, Lions Corner House, which was the equivalent of the McDonald's of his day. So, you know, he washed dishes. But to get him here, he relied on his parents. His parents were small to medium-sized coca farmers in Achim. But you know the difference between Achim now and Achim then? My grandfather was able to send my dad here to study at King's and at Gray's. He was able to do that on the proceeds of a cocoa farm. That could not happen today. No way. And that's got nothing whatsoever to do with the level of fees at King's. That's got to do, <laughs> which you know about, you don't need me to tell you about that. Um, that's got to do with cocoa prices and with costs of being a cocoa farmer in a chim today. When my grandfather sent my father here, there was a direct rail link between Tafo, where we're from, and Takaradi, which at that time was the main port. That rail link doesn't run today. Utterly degraded. Every Ghanaian government I've ever known has promised, since Kwame Nkrumah, has promised to do something about the rail network. Nothing has been done to this date. I wish I could say that was entirely the fault of the World Bank. It's partly the fault of the World Bank, partly the fault of the IMF, but not totally. It's also the fault of successive governments who have been in hock to the road transport lobby, because there's money <coughs> in road transport. And there are people who have not wanted, thank you, who have not wanted the rail link to be redeveloped. Now that's beginning to change, and the Chinese are helping to change that. And good on them. Good on them. You know, I don't knock China's involvement in Africa. China is involved in Africa for exactly the same reason as Britain and the US and everyone else is involved in Africa, because there's something in it for them. That's life. And if uh, the West chooses to step back from investment in infrastructure, when every country that's developed anywhere in the world has relied on that, on, on that infrastructure, then that's a missed business opportunity for Western business. China is taking advantage of the opportunity. 
what we need to make sure of in Africa is that that advantage is not taken at our expense and that it is truly a, a partnership. And that's down to issues of governance. And there's no escaping that, uh, which is why you know, governance is important. Holding governments to account is, Im is important. But when you do that, then the opportunities are massive. And what that means is, too, is that Prime Minister Modi is absolutely right to say that he is not prepared to sacrifice the welfare and well-being of the millions, the hundreds of millions in India who depend for any hope of upliftment on the growth of the Indian economy. He's not prepared to sacrifice that uh, because of the mistakes uh, that we in the West have made in terms, <coughs> in terms of uh, our addiction uh, to uh, carbon, carbon emissions. So there's got to be equity in, in the relationship. And African governments have got to be prepared to equip themselves, to utilize the skills that are out there, which include the skills in the diaspora, the skills that you, that you all have, and which you are making the most of. Uh, you know, African governments have got to be prepared to use and to utilize those skills. And wise, sensible uh, firms and businesses outside Africa will utilize you to help make them more marketable to those African governments. And if they don't, well, then they are missing a market opportunity. There is a reason why, there's a reason why, uh, you know, diversity makes good business sense. You know, we live in a globalized world. And you have skills... And, and a capacity to move in different cultures in ways that ought to make you eminently marketable. And where they don't, because of discrimination by virtue of race or gender, then ultimately the companies that fail to hire you will be the losers. And I think that is a big issue. It's a big issue for us in, in, in the city of London and, and in the UK. The UK is ideally placed to uh, make something of its global position because it's, this is a place and this is a city and there are numbers of cities in the UK where actually, you know, we do, you know, with all our is issues and challenges, we do actually get along pretty well, one, one, one with the other. But getting along, get it, getting along with one another by itself isn't enough. There's got to be equity in, in, in opportunity. And we all know that isn't always there. We all know that racism and uh, racial disadvantage is still a fact of life. <laughs> Gender disadvantage is still a fact of life. And that's why, you know, the, the struggle in that regard isn't, isn't over. Believe you me, it's not over. Racism is alive and well. Sexism is alive and well. And it's deep-rooted in the societies in which, in which we live. And there's still a struggle uh, to, be, to be fought. But there is a good business case uh, for diversity. There is a good business case for uh, a response, a, a, a proper and adequate response to the challenges uh, of, uh, of, uh, of climate change. But it has to be rooted in, in a reality of people's economic situation. And the opportunities, believe you me, are massive. Let me give, give you one example by way, by way of, of closing, one very positive example. I was in Nairobi a couple of weeks ago. I went to a firm there uh, that is uh, with the assistance of the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund. Uh, and, and a, 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 a substantial investment from the Challenge Fund is building two new production lines for beans, for, for, uh, uh, for, for uh, runner beans, uh, which are uh, being, being uh, grown by small and medium-sized farmers in Kenya. They are brought, they are then processed in Kenya. Uh, they uh, are processed in uh, glass jars and sold in massive quantities uh, on mainland Europe, 
Why has that market suddenly opened up? It's opened up because China is now consuming more of its own beans because of its own, own growing middle class. There's less to export. The demand in Europe is still there. And so Kenya has now stepped in on the back of China's uh, growth uh, and is providing those beans. And that is a, a real benefit to small and medium-sized farmers, bean farmers uh, in Kenya, providing them with life-changing opportunities. Uh, so, you know, it's happening. Stuff's, stuff's going on out there. And it's very, very exciting. Uh, and there's more of that. And it's possible for all of, all of you, one way or the other, to be part of that, of that story. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and watch the rest of our talks below.